I want you to watch what we're about to do because you've never seen anything like this on television. We're living in a time where deep philosophical thought is virtually absent from the media landscape, which is what makes Dr. Cornell West stand above the rest. He's an activist, professor, and literary scholar who constantly engages people in deeper dialogue about issues like class, race, war, and corporate greed. Earlier, I spoke with Dr. West, a professor of African American studies at Princeton University and co-author of the book, The Rich and the Rest of Us. I first asked him about President Obama's budget plan, planning to gut social services, and why austerity is being forced on the poorest, while corporations are reporting record profits. And here's what he had to say. It's not just President Obama, but the Democratic Party, for the most part, as a whole, is revealing its centrist and neoliberal core. Uh, but by that, what I mean is they're still very much tied to big business, big money, they're still not putting poor people, working people at the center. And they've been holding back in regard to the details. And we see now, when it comes to the details, there's a low priority for poor and working people when it comes to the Democratic Party budget. And I can't help but ask you, as someone who has some ideological roots in Marxism, what is your response to people who constantly try to label Obama as a Marxist and a socialist? <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a joke that, uh, you know, when you talk about uh, Socialists like Norman Thomas, of course, Martin Luther King Jr. was a democratic socialist at the end of his life. You're really talking about people who are putting poor people, working people at the center. You get far right who called Obama a socialist, it has nothing to do with his neoliberal and centrist practices. And he's so tied to oligarchs and plutocrats on Wall Street and other high places, so that it's a joke. It, it, it's pathetic. What damage do you think these erroneous labels do to the national discourse, and why are they perpetuated? Well, it just shows the low quality of public conversation. It's one of the things I like about RT, that you all are involved in serious reflection. Uh, you take time. You give us time to say something clearly. We're not engaged in the kind of uh, uh, obfuscation and obscuring of what is going on. We're talking about justice. We're talking about social misery. We're talking about power at the top. We're talking about humanity across the board. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, when you're watching the corporate media, you just get these very tight packages over sensationalism Absolutely. driven garbage, I like to call it, uh, when really the historical context, the social context of these issues are of the utmost importance, which is why I respect your work so much. Uh, Dr. West, you've even called Barack Obama a, quote, Rockefeller Republican in blackface who's unworthy of swearing in on Dr. King's Bible. I mean, in your experience alone, is Obama being an African-American a factor that deters people from criticizing him? Because inherently they're looking at him as a symbol of progress just for the sake of him being African-American. No, absolutely. I mean, one, there's been a shameful silence in the black community in terms of keeping alive the legacies of Martin King and Malcolm X and Fannie Lou Hamer, which is telling the truth and bearing witness to justice, beginning with black people, but concerned about what goes on in the Middle East. Palestinians just as valuable as Israelis. What's going on in Guantanamo Bay? 166 persons, 86 are now ready to go, but they refuse to be released, and there's no serious public conversation. You all have had the, 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 the courage to at least report that. What's going on in so many different arenas where the corporate media remains hidden and concealed? How many innocent children have really been killed by U.S. drones? with bombs dropped on those precious persons. Let's just tell the truth, tell the truth everywhere. Russia, United States, Ethiopia, Guatemala, Argentina. Let's, let's engage in serious highbrow journalism. Yeah, let's tell the truth and let the facts, uh, you know, go where they lay and let people decide That's what right. they want to decide based on the facts available. Thousands dead with drones. I mean, Obama's escalated That's drone right. warfare exponentially. It's really astounding when you look at the visualization of this data, uh, Dr. West. And I wanted to, to actually expand the conversation to racial inequality. It's so staggering when you look at the prison industry alone yes. in this country. I mean, it's alleged, and I don't know if this is actually true. I've heard both facts that there are more African Americans in prison today than were enslaved proportionally in, in 1850. Sorry. In fact, according to a Pew Research study, an African American male without a high school diploma is more likely to end up behind bars than get a job. I mean, why is it that the prison industry seems to be acting like the modern day slave trade? 
Well, we turn to Michelle Alexander's great book, The New Jim Crow. She's one of the great prophetic voices of our time and talks quite explicitly about the war on drugs, being a war on poor people, especially black and brown poor people, just like here in New York City. Stop and frisk, 5,000 stop and frisk cases since 2002 under Mayor Bloomberg. This is a law, this is a mayor that the president says is a terrific mayor, but 5 million stop and frisk, 87 percent black and brown, only 2 percent tied to criminal activity. That's the kind of autocratic, authoritarian sensibility we see expanding in the United States, and we have to be honest about it. We have to fight, about it, fight against it. We have to protect rights and liberties of everyone. Dr. West, coming from Oakland to D.C., hearing so much racist comments about how um, Oakland has a lot of crime because it's predominantly African-American. I mean, when you're looking at things like stop and frisk, obviously these institutionalized policies of racism, of over-policing African-American uh, areas of, the, of cities, I mean, of course that's what's going to happen, is you're going to have a disproportionate representation oh, of absolutely. these minorities in prisons. And it, I, I can't help but think, reckon back again to Martin Luther King, I mean, last week was the 45th anniversary of his assassination. Yeah. I'm sure. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? <laughs> I'm sure you're aware. Years. 45 years, Dr. West, and still yeah. people are unaware. No, something, something died. Something died in, in, in all of us. But think 13% of black youth addicted to drugs, 13% of white youth addicted to drugs, 65% of convictions in America are black. If you want to deal with criminality, you ought to start on Wall Street. Look at insider trading, market manipulation, fraudulent accounting. Why is it not one executive of a Wall Street firm has been investigated or prosecuted? Many of them are dining in the White House, but actually involved in activity that is quite criminal. And it's not a matter of trashing Wall Street. Human beings are human beings. Let's have a fair rule of law, not capricious and arbitrary for the poor, targeting the poor and allowing the well-to-do to somehow get off. That's true for wiretappers. That's true for torturers under the Bush administration. Why are they walking around sipping tea when they violated the law? And let's be very honest about it. As you noted, I've accused uh, the president himself of being a war criminal in terms of the killer list every Tuesday and, and, and engaged in activities that result in the death of innocent civilians, especially children. Those are war crimes. They're war crimes if they're committed by Americans, Russians, Ethiopians. Argentinians, Guatemalans, Africans, these are, these are forms of activity where people ought to be accountable. But Dr. West, we live in a two-tiered justice system where the war criminals are not prosecuted or even investigated, and instead the war crime whistleblowers, the people who expose That's these right. war crimes, are in prison. It's a, a completely egregious system, and it's amazing that more people don't point this out as poor people are the ones suffering on the other end of it. I mean, I'm sure you're aware of even the civil case launched by the Martin Luther King family. Martin Luther King Jr.'s family that implicated the U.S. government in part for conspiracy for his assassination. I mean, why is it that 10 years on, this notion is so foreign to people, still scoffed at as nothing more than a conspiracy theory, when at the time, subject to years of COINTELPRO surveillance, uh, death threats, That's I mean, exactly this is coming, right. these this is, this are all declassified documents. No, it's true. I mean, of course, the FBI were, had Brother Martin under surveillance from January 1956 till the day he died, April 4th, 1968. That was the U.S. government. It was JFK. That was RFK. It was Johnson all the way through. But I think, for example, of our dear sister who just died, Margaret Thatcher. Now, here's someone who called Nelson Mandela a terrorist, called the ANC a terrorist group. Here's somebody who said trade unionists in England are the enemy within. They must be crushed. And yet, what do we hear from the White House? Margaret Thatcher was a great champion of freedom. I say, why tell that lie? I pray for her family. I'm a Christian. But she was a tyrant when it came to black people in South Africa. She was a tyrant when it came to working people in Britain. Let's just tell the truth about our dear sister, whether she's alive, whether she's dead. Because these, these people are deified, like Reagan. I mean, he's hailed as this yeah. economic hero. I mean, we love, it's amazing. I mean, in their death, we should be telling the truth. Let's not sugarcoat what the legacy of these people really is. Um. <laughs> when Reagan talks about the repression of Jews, in Russia, for example, we all now say he was right. That's fine. But when he engages in the marginalizing of black people and poor people in America, somehow that's irrelevant. We don't want to talk about it. We only want to talk about him a defender of freedom vis-a-vis -vis communism or the Soviet Union. We say, no, wait a minute. Let's be truthful across the board. Every person pressures, whether they're in Russia, United States, or anywhere else. 
Well, Dr. West, when you're asking people to be truthful across the board, it forces them to face their own biases, their own prejudice. Uh, it's yeah, very difficult to do that. And let's talk about Occupy Wall Street. Um, you were actually arrested at one instance. You were a fervent supporter of it. I mean, Occupy Wall Street, when you're looking at what happened, brutally suppressed by militarized police, federalized crackdowns across the board. What do you tell people who are scared to protest because they're worried that they'll get arrested, beaten, or just simply surveilled in the massive surveillance grid that exists today? Well, one, I was blessed to go to jail because I was willing to bear witness and deal with the consequences. I would do it again, but there's no doubt there's an increasing repression. There's an attempt to create a culture, not just of silence, but a culture of fear, especially for the younger generation, to intimidate them, to make sure they're so afraid that they're not willing to step out, bear witness in public, and have to deal with the consequences of, of civil disobedience. We just simply have to have more courage that we're, we're dealing now with a much more autocratic and authoritarian state and you have to be more courageous. You have to be more courageous to tell you the truth. You have to be more willing to deal with the cost. And in the end, uh, some of us simply have to die. That's all. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the chilling effect is what they're counting on, uh, Dr. That's West. True. And we that's can't true. let that win. We can't we let cannot. fear win. That's exactly right. And of That's course, right. Occupy Wall Street's rooted in anti-corporatism. A lot of people That's look right. at the form of capitalism we're living under today, and they say it's not true capitalism. It's crony capitalism, and capitalism is the only answer. What's your response? I say, one, we have to acknowledge there's a variety of different kinds of capitalism. There, there are vampire vulture capitalism that are just survival of the slickers. And then you've got Sweden, where you have a much more... Uh, uh, a softer capitalism where the poverty rate is two or three percent and the children receive high quality education. But I think generally speaking, capitalism as a system tied to the quest for profits with an asymmetric relation of power between bosses and workers, it's very logic tied to profits with hierarchies at the workplace. It's very logic tends to lead toward, for the most part, wealth inequality that in the end is usually unjustified. And so I tend to be a critic of capitalism across the board, just like I'm a critic of imperialism, white supremacy, male supremacy, anti-Semitism, anti-Arab, anti-Muslim sensibility, and I'm very suspicious actually of various vulgar forms of nationalism that tend to be chauvinistic, that think that somehow only a human being within national borders has value and those outside have no value or much less value. But because we live in a moment in which capitalism is so ubiquitous, it is so hegemonic, it is leading toward its own internal collapse. There's no doubt about that given the ecological catastrophe. But we still got a way to go and we still have to fight day in and day out. Even when the reforms are not enough, the reforms do make a difference because every individual ought to be viewed as being precious. But I think in the end, we're going to need the fundamental transformation of a capitalist and imperialist world. Yes. Uh, I, I definitely think uh, thinking of states as just nation states and, and not extending empathy across nation states is one of the yes. biggest deterrents toward world peace and also just global empathy and global consciousness. But aside from that, I mean, capitalism and imperialism seem to go hand in hand where you have the global hegemon now encroaching on the last remaining independent states that are bucking the world system and crushing them and, and, and trying to destabilize them. And it worries me because, and, and what I want to get your opinion on, is, is a system of conscious capitalism where the free markets harmonize with the planet instead of concentrating wealth very narrowly, is this attainable? Well, I mean, we've got to believe that uh, either it is or it's a regulative ideal that's worth fighting and dying for. It might be, of course, that the species as a whole just doesn't possess the moral and intellectual capacities to sustain itself on the globe given the levels of greed and envy and resentment but especially the power at the top that could be a possibility that takes us to art that takes us to samuel beckett it takes us to Chekhov, it takes us to john coltrane and tony morrison and others but in the end we have to believe that we can make a difference and therefore capitalism ought to be not just criticized but we still ought to fight to fundamentally transform it. But this is true for patriarchy. This is true for homophobia. It's true yeah. for white supremacy. It's true for all of these various systems that lose sight of the humanity of other people. And we'll die struggling for these causes, Dr. West. And That's right. Absolutely. And pass it on to the younger generation. <laughs>
oh, pass yes. on the problems to oh, them. Oh, yes, indeed, but, indeed. But you're right. I mean, we, you know, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. You wouldn't be doing what you're doing if we didn't have faith that humanity could turn this around, that we could really come up on top um, and win over this global struggle. And I wanted to actually uh, mention a podcast that you just had with Dr. Ron Paul, uh, Congressman Ron Paul which really does uh, showcase how there's a lot that libertarians and leftists can agree on. We can unite on a lot of things against the establishment instead of having such a fragmented opposition. How can we focus more on this unification? Well, there are going to be a number of different coalitions in coming together that will surprise people that Brother Ron Paul and Brother Rand Paul I come together with in terms of their defense of rights and liberties. Uh, uh, the, the drones have been the focus of the 13-hour uh, filibuster by Brother Rand Paul. I thought it was wonderful. I wish that he had talked about non-Americans as well as Americans, mm -hmm. but at least the issue uh, uh, received a certain publicity and visibility. When it comes to Ron Paul, in the, in the dialogue that we had, I come together with him and his powerful rejection of the Patriotic Act, his powerful rejection of the National Defense Authorization Act, where the president has the right to detain American citizens without due process, without a trial, without any judicial process whatsoever. That's the signs of an authoritarian state. Of course, the problem is my libertarian brothers and sisters, they are very sensitive to highly concentrated forms of power when it comes to the government, but they don't talk about the highly concentrated forms of power when it comes to corporations, the big banks, the oligarchs and plutocrats. Seems to me we have to have what the great Jane Austen called constancy. We have to have moral consistency. We ought to be critical of highly concentrated forms of power wherever we find it because it, that kind of power is usually subject to chronic abuse and it affects each and every human being no matter where they are. And, and Dr. West, knowing this, I mean, taking all of this into account, I mean, the corporate takeover of governments clearly more apparent than ever before. Inequality is greater mm -hmm. than ever before. What is the solution, I guess? Is it to just to keep fighting within the system that we have and outside of the system that we have and kind of conjoining the radical faction and the establishment faction to really try to make a, a difference? I mean, do you recommend a complete overhaul, ideally? Well, I think we have to be jazz-like, because I'm a jazz man. You have to be <laughs> improvisational. You have to be flexible and fluid. You have to fight on the outside, bring pressure to bear. Then you have to fight with some progressive insiders who haven't sold their souls and been so thoroughly co-opted by position and and, and wealth and, and power that they no longer want to tell the truth. There's some Bernie Sanders and others on the inside who want to tell the truth about corporate power. We need organizations, movements on the outside bringing pressure to bear. In the end, we do need a fundamental transformation. There's no, there's no doubt about that. But we've got a long way to go in that regard. The first moment is one of social motion. Then you got social momentum. And if we can generate social movements, then we've got something. Absolutely. I can't see lobbyists uh, stopping uh, bribing on the Hill anytime soon. I definitely agree that we do need a fundamental transition and overhaul of the current system that we have. Dr. Cornell West, activist, author, professor, amazing to have you on. Thank you so much. Blessing. You stay strong, my dear sisters. Continue to be in the force for good you are. Thank you so much. I agree with Dr. West. We need to be working through all avenues that are available to us right now, inside and outside of the system, until there's an impetus for a revolution of values. And only when that happens can we seize the opportunity to implant the fundamental changes needed to move this country and the world toward a more equal, sustainable, and peaceful future.